Alrighty. Thank you for coming, guys. I appreciate it. The lights are dim here so that we can use the screen later, which I don't know if that'll actually work or not, so you'll find out. Um, I wanted to start, I guess, with housekeeping things. I feel I feel a little bad because uh, I feel like just last time I was in here, I threw a big announcement, by the way, change, see you later, and I run away because I'm afraid of the backlash of change. But um, one of the things I guess I wanted to mention is uh, I, I find myself a little nervous trying to monkey with something that has been going so well for so long. I really don't prefer to do that um, if, if ever I can. But I was in kind of a situation where I thought, uh, I'm teaching the Old Testament, which I, I enjoy because I probably learn more than you guys do. That's why I enjoy it. But the Old Testament's big. It's really large. And the thought of trying to get through a topic, this topic is uh, history of Israel. We're, we're going to try to cover the book of Joshua all the way up through Esther. A thousand years of history. And that's a very ambitious uh, task. So it's going to be broken up into two of our, uh, our MIDA, our Discipleship Academy trimesters, so two different 15-week periods. So we have roughly 30 weeks uh, to get through that. And my quandary here, I guess, I, I want you guys to be in the loop. And you are the people that showed up on time, so I assume that you'll be able to communicate to everyone else who shows up at 6.30 or later, because that's what they're used to. Um, I do not want to come in and... Uh, kind of bulldoze something that's already been going on. I want to be supportive of the crowd that we have here and make it as adaptable to them as possible. However, uh, as I was explaining a second ago, I'm nervous, so I had to take my shoes off, so now I'm barefoot. I'm quite different <laughs> than uh, you know, sweaty feet. i got to deal with that. So I am not going to be the least bit offended if someone is put off by me and, you know, I need to learn the Bible from someone who's a little more respectable. I, I do not want to be a distraction to you, so don't, don't feel bad about that because I don't want to be a distraction. But also, um, my plan is here, since we've got a two-hour time slot, I'm going to try not to have to use all two hours, but uh, the plan is to take, after an hour, to take a break, five or ten minutes, so that we can stretch our legs, engage again, and then uh, come back and finish up the material. But uh, I am very open, and so I want this group to know that if <coughs> we would prefer to do something different, I can teach this differently. All, all, I, all I really need is two hours in a week, I think, to stand a chance of getting through the material. But the two hours do not have to be on Tuesday. They could be split up between Tuesday and Thursday if we want, or we could keep them all in one night. Some people might prefer to have an hour Bible study and then take a day's break and then come back. So the paper that I put on the tables is for you to decide, and if you want to wait till afterwards so you size me up, see if you're awake by the end of this, uh, you can circle which one you like. If you have a preference, uh, and I'll gather these up afterwards and decide, because I want everyone to have input here. And if anyone comes in later, and I forget to mention it, if you could point them to these papers so that they can let me know if they would prefer to uh, go back to the 6.30 time and uh, maybe add a Thursday study, if that's a possibility. So uh, hopefully that's clear so far. The, the other thing was, since I moved it back to 6 o'clock, I recognize some people work, which is good, good job. But because you work, you probably get hungry and you may not have time to eat. So the church gets an excellent price on pizza, and I'm more than happy to go pick it up. I, that, that pizza is there for the taking tonight. Um, if, if people donate a dollar or two, it'll cover it. Um, any extra will just go into the MIDA missions budget, that'd be fine. Um, but I'll just be trying to be paying attention to how much is eaten so I know how much to get. And if people don't want pizza, that's fine, but I like an excuse to go get it. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's there for you guys if need be, and just give me your feedback because I I want it to be I want to be as helpful as possible. For some reason, and I don't understand why, uh, but my grandfather decided that he, he he sent me a nice email and he, he said, you know, it's time for me to uh, step down on Tuesday evenings, and I'm going to 
pass it off, and he suggested that I do my Old Testament class. Now, I'm just telling you that to say that he endorsed me. He did. And if, if, if you don't like it, well, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But anyway, I, that, that happened recently, and so I'm like, oh boy, here it comes. Um, so you just got to remember, he's got a few years of experience on me. He might want you to wear a tie with those bare feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hopefully you don't say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, we better be careful. So, um, I think I've said enough by way of introduction. Uh, and I'll be collecting those papers afterwards. You can just leave them on the table. Uh, we're going to get started in the book of Joshua. and. And so if you want to turn there, that would be great, because uh, I don't have any uh, particular handouts or anything. What I do have, though, is a lot of reading ahead of us. We're ambitious. I want to try to get through eight chapters today, if at all possible, eight chapters. We may have to summarize a bit. But um, the reason for that, the reason why we want to be so ambitious is because we're trying to get through the entire Bible and then some in three years. That is... Uh, that is for the benefit of the college students we have with us, but it's also for all of our benefit, because uh, it's one thing to be studying the Bible, and that's good, but what if you could take the exact same Bible study and train someone to go into ministry at the same time? When I, when I first you know, started thinking about that, I thought, wow, the potential is here. We've already got the instruction. Let's just put it together with training, and, uh, and so that's what we want to do as much as possible. But it's also a dual benefit. Not only do these guys get to, uh, you know, get trained for ministry and have kind of an overview of the entire Bible, it's also good for us because, you know, if you, if you stick at church long enough, you're going to get through the entire Bible in just a few years. And when we come back, it'll probably get better each time. We'll probably have more insights next time. Sometimes in, in long classes, we'll focus a little bit more on one book, overview another book, just so we can get it from different angles. Um, I really think when we study God's Word, um, I have some biases, and, and I need to get those out on the table. I think that if God, um, because He is God, He is able to communicate effectively to the average Joe. I, I think that God is capable of revealing Himself in a way that we don't have to be experts to understand. I think God can actually communicate. Because He is God, He can actually communicate to us in a meaningful way, and he uses his word to do that. Uh, I've seen time and time again where I'm convinced that some of the more intelligent people have brought us away from the scripture because of their intelligence. You know, that it's, it's just a web of possibilities that we get sucked into, and wait a minute, the Bible is pretty basic and pretty clear. You don't have to have a degree to get that one, right? Roger Chambers uh, used to say, uh, there are a lot of scriptures that uh, it would take professional help to misunderstand. <laughs> and then in the next breath he would say, and by the way, there's a whole lot of professional yeah. help out there. <laughs> so true. Just grab a commentary and you can be led astray. No, just, uh, but, so that's something we need to be careful about. But as I study this, I want to make sure we don't miss the whole. What is going on? Because sometimes it's easy to get lost, you know, you, you can't see the forest for the trees or whatever. It's easy to get lost in there, but we want to know what is going on. What is God doing throughout this period of history? What is he doing in this text? And are the, if there are things throughout the text that get in the way of our understanding, then we need to try to deal with those. I've also noticed that preconceptions uh, or misunderstandings can cloud, uh, can cloud Bible study. It can really hinder a good study because... I just can't wrap my mind around that. How, how could walls have come down? That just I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. Well, hopefully we'll deal with some of that. I want you to feel free to raise questions if you want. As long as you don't mind me telling you, I don't have time to deal with that, can we move on? And you don't cry about it or get offended or anything. Uh, I, I won't be offended by you, most likely. Most likely. But no, I... I Seriously welcome that if uh, you want to have a discussion because I want people to understand hopefully what the text is saying at least as much as I can aid in that. And so it doesn't do any good if I'm running my mouth and we don't understand. So because we have such large sections of reading, my idea was to bring out the mugs. Ah, the mugs. These are for sale, $5 if you want to keep one by the way. But uh, these mugs 
have special power. They have the power to communicate to me that you would like to read. That you would like to be a reader of scripture to the entire group. And so my goal is to, uh, to not make you listen to me the entire time. But because there's so much reading out there to be done, and not everyone is comfortable reading, I didn't want to put just anyone on the spot. So I'm going to try to have the mugs out. And if anyone would like, I'm going to walk around right now. If you do not mind reading out loud multiple verses for the group, I would like to hand you this mug so that I can pick on you during tonight's study. Ooh. Oh. Raise their hand. Oh, raise my hand. One, two. I might run out, so let's go over here. Competition. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And I've got one left. I saw your hand raised, so. Parker, help him. Yeah, if I can't pronounce the words. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'll do some of the reading, but to mix it up, hopefully, I'll call it some I said, I brought my King James Version tonight. Oh, that's okay. That's good practice for us, for me especially. Can you interpret that for me when you're done reading it? <laughs> I just well, big print. Oh, good, good. That's what we want. Um, the book of Joshua. Tradition states that uh, Joshua was written, and it... it Joshua is written by, guess who? Just guess. Joshua. Joshua. That's what tradition states. So the book of Joshua, tradition says, written by Joshua. That's logical. It makes sense. Uh, there are critical debates going on about, you know, oh, I think it was written way later. But the author seems to be aware, and hopefully we'll point some of this out. The author seems to be aware of things happening the way they happened at that time. It does not sound like someone removed from the events going back and recalling. Because some of the little nuances he gets right just lends itself to think this is more like an eyewitness account. So the book of Joshua starts off, the first date we have is going to be 1406 B.C. 1406 B.C. is going to be our starting date for the book. And actually, it mentions the time period. It's going to be around March to April uh, would be the time that the first date is mentioned there. So, so cool. it's nice that we actually have something we can pinpoint a little bit better. All right, with that in mind, let's, let's get into chapter 1, verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun. By the way, you know Joshua is the only one that had no parents. Son of Nun. <laughs> uh, all right, no, sorry. He said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses assisted. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Makes you want to go walking, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward uh, Toward the going down of the sun will be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. You're going to hear that again. Pay attention to the number of times we hear that. <laughs> be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only what? Be strong, be strong and very courageous. Yeah, be strong and very courageous. Being careful to do according to all the law Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you what? Be strong, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I counted three times. Did I count right? Yeah. Three times in a row. Be strong and courageous. 
Now, I, I, I don't know how relatable this is to you. It is very much so to me. When, uh, how do you follow somebody like Moses? How do you follow somebody like Moses? Well, the truth is you don't. There is no, there is no true, you, you can't be another Moses per se. But however, God has a way of stepping in and saying, be strong, be courageous. Why? For I am with you. Now, my question is, how do we know God is with us? I mean, couldn't a lot of people say, well, I'm strong, therefore God must be with me. Or, uh, I'm doing really well in my ministry, so therefore I know God is with me. How do we know that God is with us? He tells us in his word. And isn't it interesting that when he says to Joshua, when he says, hey, I, the Lord, am with you, he then also happens to say, by the way, that book of the law, my word, the Bible back then, shall not depart from you. You need to meditate on that thing. Isn't that interesting? Even way back then, and this same thing applies to us, God is with us even more so now. So we can't be afraid. we got to do it. So i got to look in the mirror and say, Seth, you got to teach tonight. You can't be afraid because God's word has been given to you. Can't hold it back, right? We've got to get the word out there. Verse 10, could I have... Let's practice your reading skills. Are you at verse 10? <laughs> yeah. Can you read verses 10 through 18, please? All right. Mine's uh, the New Living Translation. Okay. Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Yeah. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the, la of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh. Yeah. He told them, remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God is giving you a place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east side of the Jordan River. But your strong warriors, fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has given you rest, and until they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them. Only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River, in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, assigned to you. They answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us, and we will go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as you obeyed Moses. And may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong and courageous. Wow. Wow. Now it's the people. These people recognize something very important about uh, this Joshua. And that is that he is God's man for the job. He is the leadership that God has chosen, right? Who is the leadership that God has chosen for his church today? Us. In a lot of ways, us, but more specifically, who is responsible to give an account? The eldership. The eldership, yeah. And in a lot of ways, uh, time and time again, if there's a problem in a church with the eldership, there's a problem usually throughout the entire church. And, and we see this, it goes both ways, right? When it comes down to ministry, sometimes sometimes you have a strong eldership that, I don't know, may, uh, may put people off and then the wife gets conflict and it goes back and forth. And there can just be that, too controlling. And sometimes that causes issues. However, many times, it seems like we're seeing this a lot today, it's uh, the opposite. It's an eldership that, oh, they kind of exist, but not really. And then there's this preacher guy, we often call him pastor, but that's not technically correct, but he's often called that. And he is calling the shots, basically. And the eldership isn't doing anything. Now, some churches seem to grow and do really well that way. Problem is, that's not God's model. And ultimately, we've seen time and time again, that church can get to a really great numerical status, but then... When the preacher falls, when he commits a sin that, you know, shouldn't have been done, he gets caught embezzling or something like that, what happens to the church? Well, 
It crumbles. It, and why wouldn't it? Because the leadership was not the leadership that God designed. Um, same thing is true for us. If God told us to do something and put us in charge of something, that is a leadership position that we have, and we don't need to be afraid to do it. We need to do it. Um, by that I mean, if God's given us his word and we're supposed to make disciples, well, we can make excuses, but excuses can't stop us because God has given us the tools by which to get the job done. And these people recognized Joshua's leadership, and we need to recognize uh, the leadership of the church, um, the job the elders have, so that their work can be a joy. Wouldn't that be great? Something that they really enjoy doing. Now, I'm going to draw a little map for you. Please don't be too critical. <laughs> All right. Up here, this is supposed to be the Mediterranean Sea. It's often referred to as the Great Sea. I don't want to spell Mediterranean, so please forgive me. But down here, this is the land of Egypt. And then we have the Red Sea, which is kind of this, this funny shape looking thing. Now remember, the Israelites, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they crossed, uh, they crossed through the Red Sea. God put it up. And then they came here. The Promised Land is located roughly in this region. We've got the Jordan River here, Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea. And the Jordan River is right in the middle. And that kind of marks the land of Palestine, that the Canaanites own. And it was promised to the Israelites. Well, when they first came up there, uh, what happened? They were supposed to come right straight from here and then go in and take the land. But did it work out that way? No. No, why? They came back and said, well, some of them came back and said, they're too big. 12 men went to spy on Cain and 10 were bad and 2 were... You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> remember that song? Uh, they came to a place called Kadesh Barnea and they sent out the 12 spies from the, each of the tribes and they said, spy out the land. And 10 of them were shocked. They were... They were they were shocked at how huge these guys are. Look at them. Are they sumo wrestlers? I mean, they're massive. But the other two, the godly two, what were their names? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Those two said, God's on our side. Let's go. Let's go. Let's. Caleb, by the way, I love Caleb because even uh, you read about him as an 80-year-old man, and he's saying the exact same thing. He's like, you know what? I'm as good as I was when I was a kid. Give me that land. Give me that land that God's. God's promise. I'm going to take it. I hope I'm not. <laughs> so come back to me and make sure I am. Um, so anyway, they that force that poor decision caused them to wander around the wilderness until that generation died. That's when Joshua picks up. And where we are talking right now is this: they are ready to cross into the land and take it. The first city that they're going to bump into when they when they come there is a city called, with huge walls. What is that city called? Ai. Jericho. Jericho. And then the second little city after that is going to be the city of Ai. So that's what he's getting ready for. But there's a big mission ahead. And so that's a little bit of the backdrop. We're getting ready for him to come into that land and take it over. Yeah. Push. Push. All right. And that brings us to the second chapter, doesn't it? <clears throat> that it does. Joshua chapter 2. And Joshua, son of nobody, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joshua, son of none, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered the house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to close at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly. For you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them in the stalks of flax she had laid in order, uh, laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know. How'd she know this? This is interesting. 
I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord, what? What did they hear about? Had dried up the Red Sea. God's reputation was already, a, keep in mind, Red Sea, down here, we're up here. It had spread. Um, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. That's another way of saying killed. Utterly destroyed. Utterly killed. And those were massive, huge, giant kings that, that God had allowed Israel to defeat. Whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. Melted. By the way, it's just funny that we use that in a different way. Their hearts melting is not a romantic thing. It's a, <laughs> I'm scared to death. Not a, not a, oh, I love you. No, no, no. We're not that kind of heart melt. Their hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth uh, beneath. Uh, man, it was in Roman study just last night. We we're talking about God isn't possible to be known. He isn't out there and kind of revealing a little bit about himself so that people could try and eventually learn who he is. What does it actually say about God? He is no. plainly known. There is no excuse for anyone. And this foreigner, this prostitute, is the person that recognizes that God, that part of those waters, he is God. There's a reason why we're all afraid, and I know whose side I'm jumping on. And isn't it interesting, of all the, of all the people that could have, uh, could have helped them out, it would be not only a foreigner, but a very wicked foreigner with a wicked occupation. Steps in there, and she, what she did was treasonous, basically, to her people. To do that, to hide spies, is, I'm sure it's worthy of death. You just do not do something like that. So she made a choice when she did that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> somebody's asked me this before, and I didn't know how to answer them. Okay. Was she, was Rahab not judged? Well, okay, let's, was she, because she, it seems to me like she deceived her own people, right? Uh, but we find out that what she did was a good thing, right? Wh whose side she chose was a good thing, yeah. Um, okay, well, so what she did was not, a, I mean, yeah, was she yeah. a, was she allowed to deceive because she wasn't judged by the law or something like that? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, uh, I guess I would be, I, I want to be careful answering that because it mentions her occupation too, and it doesn't say anything bad about it, but we know right. it was a very bad occupation. That makes sense. And... We know that Romans 8.28 applies, but, but that God works through history to bring about certain results. But just because he works through something doesn't mean that he's endorsing that action. Sometimes those actions are very, very bad. Um, so I'm afraid to answer your question. There's a part of me that wonders, hmm, is, is this somehow a justifiable lie? I don't know that there is such a thing as a justifiable lie. I, I think it was still bad. But every, every, she was in a situation where, and sin does this, it gets you in a situation where no matter what you do, it's going to be bad. That's because you chose to give in to sin in the first place. And once you're there, you're in a bad place that God, God quite frankly, God sent his son to die so that we didn't have to be there. So we can be, uh, have that guilt removed. So I don't know how to fully answer that question. No, I appreciate the discernment. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps others could shed light on that, but yeah. Yeah, um... Yeah. I know it doesn't really fit into what he's saying, but later on she does become uh, married to the in, into the Jewish family and becomes one of the line for Jesus, uh, uh, for David. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's atonement there. Or, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, um, because she does go become part of the Jewish family after that. You're saying as signs of repentance, basically, yeah. as signs that she is... Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. I think so. Um, and it's amazing. Even back in the Old Testament, uh, critics have uh, done a good job of trying to uh, put us uh, put us into this weird mindset where we say, oh, there's two gods. There's the loving, gracious God of the New Testament, and then there's the 
mean, vengeful, wrathful God of the Old Testament. And sometimes I'm afraid as Christians we just kind of accept that and move on, when in reality that is absolutely not true. If you look at the Old Testament carefully, don't just look at it from the whole, but study through it carefully, you find signs of God's great love all throughout. Just culture was different. Sometimes it's hard to see it unless you're, you're looking at it, right? So that is an important thing that I think we need to remember. Uh, got another chunk of reading here. Better keep going. Now then, <laughs> verse 12. Please swear to me by the Lord. As I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my mothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she had lit, so that she lived in the wall. Uh, at the very end of this, toward the end, we're going to get into a little bit of the archaeology that they found over there. But archaeology kind of backs that up. It's really kind of cool. So we're going to get to that. Um, and she said to them, "Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned." Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless to the respect to this, or with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then... If anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on his own, shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. What if she hadn't? They would kill. What if she had? I'm sorry, what did you say? They would have been annihilated. Yeah, there. yeah. But would it have been, I mean, she did save them, right? So what if she forgot? What if she put it off, and she was going to tie that red cord there, but she just didn't have a chance to get around to it? But she saved them, right? So is that okay? Will that work? No. no. But she did save them, right? She did that. Okay, so we're giving her credit for that. Well, what if, I don't know, what if she went and tied it, but she didn't tie a very good knot, you know? And the thing blew away. Isn't that a real possibility of what might happen? Sure. So she won't be killed then, right? She'll, she'll still be saved. You guys are saying no again, man. This is a tough crowd. You're not giving her any credit. You realize this woman did all this work to save these people, and because of a stupid little, uh, silly little rope, you're just going to say she dies, right? The spies wouldn't have known whether she stood up to them or did what she promised or not. I so agree with you. <coughs> and what I don't understand today is people who say, oh, I love God or whatever. Um, I, I'm committed to him. I'm giving my life to him. Uh, I don't think I need to be baptized. <laughs> I don't see the reason for that. I mean, God knows my heart. He knows who I am. He knows how much I love him. Well, that's nice. I'm really glad you love God, and I'm really glad God knows your heart and everything. But what on earth does that have to do with just this basic thing called obedience? Mm. If, if she didn't tie that cord there, do we really want to have... All right, I'm sorry. Now I'm off on a tangent. Do we really want to have big, long religious debates about the salvation of Rahab, whether or not she properly tied the red thing, red cord in the window. My guess is that's silly. We, we don't want to spend our time debating that. But my question is then, why is it we today, as many churches, are debating this issue about this one simple act of baptism where God says, you know, I forgive your, you know, do it for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Why do we spend so much time debating and asking questions like, well, what if you don't? 
What if you don't? Well, what if Rahab didn't tie the uh, cord there? What if she forgot? I don't know. I, my mind tells me, my, my reason tells me, she shouldn't expect to be saved, right? Because she made a big blunder and they said, we're released from the oath. Don't know exactly what's going to happen to her. I just know that is not a place where you want to be in and it is not a logical place to ever be in. And I would just encourage you to think that way about anything God says to do for any reason. And when God says, well, God gives the mission to go in there, baptize them, teach them. And when he says that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, I don't think we need to debate what happens if I don't do it. And I don't think we need to get distracted on that because the Bible doesn't say, but what it does say is pretty clear, right? It's not that hard. If you do something for forgiveness of sins, I think that means that's something that God said to do is pretty important, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, it's so funny that there's a lot of religious debate out there on this topic. And it's as simple as that other topic, right? It's as silly as debating the red cord. But I guess we're human, so we find things to debate about. Where, where was I? Do you remember where I was? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what verse was I on? Verse 22. 22? They departed. Is that right? 22? They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, son of nobody, I mean, son of none, <laughs> and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Melt as in they're scared. Not, they're falling in love with them. They're scared. They melt away. This is not the only time that God has allowed his people to be exposed to the fear of the enemy so that they can be encouraged, they can be bolstered. Do you remember another character in the Bible, and we're going to get to him eventually, where he, he was really afraid, but God allowed him to overhear an enemy camp, and one guy talks about, man, I had this dream last night, and, oh, it scared me to death. And then the other guy said, that's got to be that guy. It's, it's got to be him. Do you remember? Does this sound familiar? Somebody tell me, because I don't want to get it wrong. Gideon. Gideon. That was my guess, too, right? Gideon. This could be none other than Gideon. Well, God allowed him to see uh, something that was truly going on. And sometimes I think that's just God's grace. He doesn't have to do that. He can tell us what to do. And not give us any other assurance beyond that. But yet sometimes God has a way of, <coughs> of letting us see, hey, I've plowed the ground for you. I've got this set up for you. See, I've got, I've got them primed. I'm here. I'm with you. So keep going. In the most common words of Joshua, be strong and courageous because God is with you. Chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan. And he and all the people of Israel lodged there before they passed over. Jordan River, located right here. So this is where they're at the Jordan. Normally, the uh, Jordan River is not a huge river. Today, in my understanding, is it's almost nothing because they've bought, uh, got their irrigation from it so much that it's just wasted away to a very little thing. Wow. But back then, it wasn't utterly huge, very long and twisty. But if it was flooded, which, as we're going to see, that it was in flood stage, it could be huge and very <clears> difficult <throat> or next to impossible to cross. Hmm. So, uh, at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, uh, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, and then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Does your version give a different uh, distance? 1,000 yards. What's a, that? 1,000 yards. 1,000 yards. Okay. Yeah, because they say a cubit is supposed to be this distance, so they average 18 inches, I guess. So 1,000 yards, that's pretty far back. 3,000 feet. That's, that's more than a half mile back. Think about that for a minute. Um, uh, as I think about where it was, there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it. 
in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Now we heard, a, uh, in my opinion, a rather good sermon on Sunday where he alluded to this event, didn't he? Where the priests were to walk into the water with the ark. Mm -hmm. But it's flooded. <laughs> the water's flooded. How are we going to get through? Don't worry about that. Walk into the water. And, but what I find interesting here, they had, to, they had to just trust and obey. They had to do what he said for God to uh, act. But before we get to that point, he said, everyone, I want you to get a half mile back from the ark. Why? Why? Well, that's, you guys are giving me the puzzled look that I had, too, when I thought about this. But, you, you know, after studying, reading up on it a bit more, it kind of makes sense. If you have a huge uh, group of people, uh, you know, a huge amount of people, you would think you can, you can kind of file single file or get together in clumps and make it through. But have you ever tried to be in a, a situation where there's one person trying to be seen and there's just this huge crowd? Uh, does that crowd line up single file line no. like this to stare at the person? <laughs> no, they don't, do they? What happens? They, they fan out. Right. They put the kids on their shoulders, you know, <laughs> things like that. They spread yeah. out. And if you're dealing with thousands upon thousands upon thousands, you really got to spread out. Whoa. What seems to be going on here is God's not just saying, all right, start walking. He says, I want to make sure be a half, everyone be a half mile back. Why? I want every person to see this. Wow. You see that? I want every person to see what is about to happen right here because it is important. And I, that makes perfect sense because he's going to continue to emphasize how important this event was. Not only is it being said over and over again that I'm with you, but he wants the people to see it. And so that's why he tells them, get way back because I want everyone to look. So what happens? Uh, and that is... I missed the last part. Take the Ark of the Covenant, pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Uh, oh, I messed up. That's right. Could I ask? Could I ask you to read verses uh, seven through seventeen? Thanks. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Good job, by the way. <laughs> Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off 
and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. That is quite an entrance, isn't it? I wish that happened when I came in the room. You know, just, whoa. <laughs> um, why? God isn't saying alone. He isn't just saying, I'm with you. He is showing, I am with you. Not only am I with, I was with Moses, Joshua, now I'm going to be with you. Everyone, I'm with you all. You follow his leadership the way I've set it up, I'm with you. Stand back so you can see what's about to happen. They walk in, this flooded water piles up, piles, piles, and, and heaps up at a place called Adam, which is very interesting. I want to see that. You know, it would be cool. Um, now, there's an archaeologist by the name of Bryant Wood. Or is it Woods? I don't look it up. Um, and he was talking about this. He is convinced, yeah, Bryant's Woods, um, he is convinced that there was some sort of an earthquake event that, that happened here that caused this. Yeah. Now, I want to be clear about something. I, there have been um, many a scholar, many a theologian, uh, many a commentary writer who have tried to explain away miracles by saying, oh, this is just natural phenomena that happened. And they, they devote pages to explaining how, you know, they're... They didn't really cross through the Red Sea like that. It was, uh, you know, this happened. The wind blew really strong, and it just dried it up. And, and they'll, it, to me, it's hilarious, because even if you accept their premise, so you're saying the Israelites just walked up to the river and do-do-do, oh, look, a natural phenomenon. We could walk right through. Show it stopped. How about that? You're saying the timing isn't just a little bit suspicious there? <laughs> So, man, these Israelites are just the luckiest people in the world because everywhere they go, natural phenomena paves the way for them. Come on. <laughs> Even if you accept what their point is, uh, it's still God. It, and God uses whatever means he chooses to use. Did, was, it, uh, was it just somehow natural, but the timing was supernatural, or was the entire thing supernatural? I don't think it matters. Do you? Does, it, does anyone think it really matters? Um, I think the entire circumstance of the thing. But that, that was a side note. He said in the 1920s it was documented at the location where um, this city would have been, at least they guess, this, this town of Adam, there was an earthquake. And evidently every century there is a major earthquake in that region. Um, but there was an earthquake that somehow was big enough that it shifted things in such a way that it did stop the Jordan River from flowing back in the 1920s for a period of about 20 hours. Interesting. So that may be insignificant, but it is curious. <laughs> Even naturally, it's possible for it to happen, you know, although highly... It say rose up in a heap. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just throwing that out there because I sure. thought that was what a very interesting coincidence. <laughs> See, time and time again, I think we need to remember, we need to be focusing on the fact that we are... Um, and I have to be careful with this. A lot of times I talk about Bible stories, and I, need, I try to not use those words, because the word story implies it's made up. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. historical fact. These are Bible events. These are things that really happen. And we need to be reminded of that constantly, because the word stories is thrown out all the time, and we even use it. I use it, trying to stop. But we need to be reminded of that, that these are real events. And by the way, look, here's evidence of the fact that the, the Bible's not stupid. It's talking about things that are possible to happen that can take place, and then archaeology is going to do a better job of that for us. Uh, I've got about got a little bit of time before a break. Time to jump into the fourth chapter, if that's okay with you guys. In chapter four, it says, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take the twelve men from among the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe of man, and command them, saying... All right, that was my version. I double copied a verse. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was like, this is oddly familiar. All right, so Joshua called the twelve men uh, from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed from each tribe, and he said to them, Pass on before the ark, before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, 
That is, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in a time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them, tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, because there's 12 tribes, just as the Lord had told Joshua and they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And, there, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people, according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, the people passed over in haste. By the way, sorry, I, maybe it's stuck in my mind, but don't leave out little things like uh, what the end of verse 9 and actually the beginning of verse 10. They stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished. Um, Paul... Paul gives the illustration of the Christian life as running a race. And uh, I like that analogy because it's very visual. And I'm one of those runners, the first time I went to run, I uh, ran as fast as I could and started walking. I realized how out of shape I was. But you can have a really, really great race, but if you collapse before the finish line, what good is it? I mean, oh, it could have been. Well finish what you start. Uh, it, it wasn't enough for Rahab to help the spies. She had to tie the cord and make sure it was there, like they said. Um, it wasn't enough for these people to just carry the ark and stand there and, ah, they're close enough, let's go. And then they get washed out. That'd be terrible. They waited until everything was done. And I think that's an important lesson that we don't want to gloss over. We don't need to start doing godly things. We need to well, not just start doing God's things. We need to finish what we start. We need to see things through into completion. And well, let's flip that around and put it on ourselves. Isn't it great? That there's this verse in the Bible that says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it in there, to complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? Because what if God started with me and then he didn't quite finish? Yeah. Oh, Seth, you were going to be a Happy Meal, but you're a few fries short. Sorry. Ran out of time. <laughs> Doing too many divine things. God, God finished his job. Jesus didn't take the beating and then not go to the cross. No, he went all the way through. So since he finished for us, I think uh, the same thing is due for him for sure. By the way, memorials are not unbiblical. Right? They, they are... Uh, it's commanded here. He wanted these giant stones to be heaped up mm -hmm. so that everyone would see, what is that big pile of stones? What does that mean? Oh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what mm -hmm. that means. This reminds us of what happened. Um, but a lot of times today, it, th there could be confusion, I guess, because does not God say in the second commandment that there shall be no idols, no graven images? He does say that, right? Mm -hmm. So... How do we balance the two? Are there supposed are memorials supposed to be a good thing? Because they set up physical objects here, right? Um, but there are supposed to be no graven images. How, how do we balance those two? They're not worshiping <laughs> Well, good point. They're not worshiping rocks. He told them to do that. Well, okay, you're right. He told them, so you got to do it. It's something to remind them of what God did for Ooh. them. Yeah, yeah not, definitely. Not to become God. God. Sure. Idolize it. Yeah, I think that's, I, I like what you guys are saying. I think that's true. I think an added layer to this is the fact that um, some things, it, that image is not the thing itself. It represents something. It's there to get your attention. The bread and the juice is not the actual body and blood of Jesus. It is there to remind us of his true body and blood. It isn't the real thing, okay? Um, otherwise, we'd be cannibals, and that's bad. So, But things like that, uh, there, uh, yeah, it isn't the actual thing. It is there to represent something else. However, when God talks about uh, 
not having any images. Because remember, the first command was to have no other gods before him. Right. So that rules out idols right there. You can't worship anything else except God. Mm -hmm. So I have another command that says no images. Well, think about this. If you were even... Uh, the, people, the way people would justify an image would be, well, yeah, we worship God, but we worship God through this beautiful calf. We worship God through this beautiful thing. This is our image to represent something. And sometimes that is okay in the Bible. You know, Christ himself set up the, the memorial of the Lord's Supper. But if you want an image that is supposed to represent God, God says that is impossible and no. I, God is so awesome that you cannot even represent, you represent him with an image. The, the stones that depicted this miracle, I mean, the miracle was awesome, it was, and the image was just a little pile of stones. Well, God is so awesome that even the greatest of the greatest of the greatest of images that we could conjure up or build could never hold a candle to representing him. And go, so God says, don't sell me short. Does that kind of make sense? I, I think both of those apply. Yeah. I've got two comments and questions. All right, I'm gonna sit down. Um, <laughs> the cross. Yeah. I, you know, different people, different churches. I often hear nail it to the cross and all kinds of references to the cross. And I think yeah. that I think that sometimes that goes really overboard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, and this is a personal thing, I'm a very visual guy. When I'm praying, I like to have a, a, a picture of who I'm praying to. And I, I get the feeling that that is not allowed because we can't picture God. Um, sure. Well, you can picture Jesus. Yeah, I same do thing, picture right? Jesus. But, um, that one's safe, right? Jesus, yeah, but we don't know. even know what Jesus looked like. But <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I see, what, hmm. I see what you're saying. My Was Bible it? says uh, something, it says um, the stones being raised up from the water of the Jordan signifies the resurrection from death. These 12 stones were signed showing that the resurrection, the resurrected new Israel would be a testimony of crossing of the death water. This typifies the believer experiencing with Christ's resurrection from death. That's one of those things where I just have to say, maybe, but the Bible doesn't say, so it's, I mean, that's a guy's opinion, and it might be right, it might not be, you know. It, when we get into typology, which is the study of types, which are, you know, representations of things, I, I, I always want, I, I run a little bit, but the Bible t says that certain things are a type, so I don't want to run too far, but it's very easy to, to see something in everything else, and as a matter of fact, there have even been... I read a book called The Bible Code. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was written by an atheist who says, I'm an atheist, but there is a code in the Bible, and it unlocks the secret to the future. <laughs> and what was he doing? He was reading beyond the, you know, forget what the actual text says. Let's count the letters and yeah. let's put them all together. And Yitzhak Rabin, ooh, this guy's going to be assassinated. It was actually a very fun book to read, just for comedic value or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's a case of where you get into trouble when you, you know, looks on the surface. So maybe, <laughs> I guess that's all I could say. That is interesting. And the Old Testament is full of those little analogies that point to Jesus, the Christ link, the, yeah. the what's coming in the future. Now, uh, what you said about the cross, I think um, that the good thing, the thing that popped into my head is that the New Testament authors, the Bible, actually uses the cross that way and, and it uses even the expression that he, he took our debt right and he nailed it to the cross so some of that imagery is probably okay and, and very good the bible wants us to have it but i do think we we run into where people take it too far and the cross is just mm -hmm. this mysterious it's almost like an indulgence or a uh, uh, a magic charm or something, you know, when in reality that that's an electric chair of the old days that that is an execution device Let's not forget um, If you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll <clears throat> Sometimes get really hot and bothered about the cross Saying that Christians have got it all wrong. It was an upright stake You know, it wasn't a, the cross like this. It was like this and the, the point I usually bring out when we get in this discussion is you know what? I don't care if it was a sloppy two by four. <laughs> it's not the cross. It's the one who died on it. Exactly. Right? It is the person, and it's what it represents truly. So, mm -hmm. um, please pray with me. 
God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for uh, your, your son's sacrifice on it. Thank you that he is seen throughout the pages of the Bible. Thank you that you uh, love us. And God, thank you that we're a group of people here reminded that you, you are with us. We're, we're not doing this just because we like ourselves or we're, we're in some club or something like that. God, we're doing this because we want to be uh, obeying what your word says. And because of that, we know that you are with us when we follow your word. And because of that, we know we can be strong and courageous, be very strong and very courageous. So God, I, I want to ask for me and for all these guys, uh, everyone here, please help us to be very strong and courageous Christians. Uh, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take a uh, five to ten minute break, and you can exit quietly, or you can um, come back and we'll try to finish up. So. Grab some pizza if you'd like. Oh, you pronounced all the words. I didn't think Matt would have been that helpful. I'm more of a person that is just kind of like re listening. I usually don't ask things without warning. If you listen carefully, you'll probably get the gist of it. But if there are things that you're like, I don't know. Because we're trying to cover all of the territory, but yeah, my daughter When you study for your quiz, you read a lot of that Bible. Or in the same class, so it's easier to study. Yeah, exactly. It's terrible, but it's hilarious. <laughs> 
<laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> So in chapter 4, verse 12, 11, 12, somewhere around there. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. I don't see anyone saying no. That means we're going. And, and it says there, uh, And when all the people had finished crossing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they had stood in awe of Moses in the days of all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests. Come out of the come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground. The waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. <laughs> the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. That would be right around here, March to April of 1406 BC is what we're talking about. March to April, 1406 BC. And they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Uh, and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall say, you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over. And the Lord your God did, uh, your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God 
forever. Isn't it interesting how much emphasis God puts on highlighting this event? Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating because it's, it's amazing in and of itself. But don't you think floodwaters walling up at a city kind of speaks for itself? You know, I think it does. I, I think mm, enough said. That's God right there. Yeah. But God said, no, 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 step back. Everyone look. Set up these stones. Look at Joshua. I'm exalting him. Everyone, uh, remember, when your kids ask, what are you going to tell them what these stones mean? You're going to tell them that God separated these waters just like he had separated the waters of the Red Sea earlier. It, it, God is overdoing the, uh, the fact that you need to remember this event, over-highlighting it. I mean, he's, he's pinpointing it and everything just so we remember. Yeah. I just think it's interesting is that um, you think it, at the Red Sea um, it was maybe bigger, but because of where they're going to be, they're going to see those rocks there at the Jordan more than they would at the Red Sea. Oh. So to remember both events, he actually talks about both events. Mm -hmm. So because you don't, they're probably never, a lot of the kids or whatever will never go to the Red Sea, but they will go to the Jordan all the time. Boy, that's an excellent point because their new homeland is right here and the territory of it, well, the Jordan goes right through and some of them are on the other side of the Jordan too. So yeah, you're right. It's right in their homeland. So they are going to see that region and they're going to see this pile of stones. It's, what, what was this? And God made it very clear. I want you to remember what this is. Um, mine says, my, can I tell you what mine says? Sure. I don't understand. It said these, uh, <clears throat> there were another 12 stones signifying the 12 tribes of Israel in their old life and in their old nature. Joshua erected these 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan where the ark was signifying that the Lord wanted Israel in their old nature to remain under the death water of the Jordan. This typifies that the old man of the believers should remain in the death of Christ. The two sets of the 12 stones signify that our old man has been buried and our resurrected new man is living and working with the, um, the triune God as what is that? T R I. Yeah, try you in three parts. Try you in God as yeah. one. This corresponds with the revelation in um, in uh, Ephesus or whatever twelve, mm -hmm. two, one, four, six, fifteen, and ten. Hmm. Is that not? Uh, that's just way further than I'm comfortable going. It's just saying a whole bunch of what I don't know. This means that, which means that, which means that. Maybe. <laughs> You, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable pointing at what is clear, and that's not clear to me. You know oh, what I mean? Okay. But th the stones were there as a memorial, and the death, burial, and resurrection is a good thing. So does that mean the stones link to that? Well, I can't, I don't know. <laughs> it, but it doesn't really matter much either way, I think. But, yeah, the word typify is kind of usually what clues me in. I'm like, okay, type, typify. Mm, just be careful when you hear that word, because... Usually it means somebody's opinion is being, you know, put in here. But, yeah, it is an interesting thought, though, because sometimes it, it is what happens. All right, we are in Chapter 5, as I recall. Actually, <laughs> I think when we get to Chapter 6, I'll try this projector out and see if we can get a map up here. But um, beginning of Chapter 5, let's see. Beginning of Chapter 5 says, hey, who's my reader over here? Jen, can you start me off um, with the first <laughs> nine verses? Sorry. Uh, uh, chapter five. <laughs> uh, first five verses, you say? Yes, please. All right. Start for the churches. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At the time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now, this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. That's it? Of five to? Uh, read all the way to nine. Oh, all the people that came out had been circumcised, 
But all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert forty years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the, after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained there. They remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Thank you. Thank you. So even though God had just done this miraculous, amazing event through these, with these people, bringing them through, the very next command was, you guys need to, uh, you need to circumcise everyone who hasn't been circumcised. That was the sign of the Jews. That was the sign of the covenant. That was what God had uh, determined. And then after they do this, this physical action, they are, well, what, is the, what do the words say? Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from Egypt. It's as though Egypt, a lot of times, if we're talking about Lynn, if we're talking about types, Egypt is oftentimes typed as the world or sin, you know, bondage. It's just a perfect illustration. Well, it's a good illustration here, too, in, in more ways than one. You still got a little bit of that, that Egypt left on your body, so to speak. You know what I mean? You still got a little bit of that reproach, that sin stuck to you. It's clinging there. It's like dirt. I need to wash that away. And he says, today, when you've completed this act of circumcision, you have rolled, today I've uh, rolled that guilt away. Now, the question here, though, is remember what God had said before that. He said, I'm with you. Be brave. And then he, he parted the waters for them. How did he do all that if they still had sin? You know what I mean? If they still had reproach, how is it that after all that happens, God says, you know, I'm, now I'm making you right with me. Isn't that kind of funny? Um, it, it seems a little strange, and I'm asking you to think about this because I think it's an important point that um, is all throughout the Bible, actually. Just because God does a miracle or a powerful event or works through a person does not mean that that person is right with him. Mm. Um, can you think of any examples in Scripture that maybe w would fit that? Can you think of anyone with that? Samson. <laughs> well, Samson, yeah, what does it say about Samson? He, he spent the night at a hooker's house, and then after that, the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he tore down the gates of the city. I don't think God's endorsing what that guy did, but yet God's Spirit still worked through him. Yeah. Um, the one that always gets me is the guy who had a, you know, a donkey had to talk sense into him. But think about him. He's basically a sorcerer. The, the, there's just not a lot of good that can be said about the guy. And as a matter of fact, even in the New Testament, we're, we're, we're still slamming the guy. We're still saying bad things about him. I believe in Revelation, letters to churches right there. Anyway, horrible things about this guy. But did he have divine knowledge that was provided by God? Well, yeah, God did that. Um, and so that is an interesting study to be done that people today really need to understand just because God's working through your ministry, just because God's doing great things in your life, does not automatically put a stamp that says, therefore, you are right with God and everything that you say is true. No, no. You could, you could be used by God in many ways, whether you're good or bad or anywhere in between, you know, or you're a donkey. But it does not put God's stamp of approval on you. There's more to it than that, and that's where the word comes in. Yeah. Isn't it where, like, he talks about Nebuchadnezzar using the evil of the world to fulfill or do his work? Oh, with the statue, you mean? No. In the nations? Well, just, just him himself, his country to come over and destroy oh, Jerusalem. He yes. uses them. You're right. He's an evil, considered an evil power, but he's using them. He did that through the whole Bible. Yes. He, he calls those nations, they're my axe. Yes. I'm going to chop your tree down with them. Yeah, very good point. Doesn't make them righteous. He deals with them after the fact, too, for being who they are. And Balaam, by the way, was he was dealt with, you know. Um, but I think you guys understand that. But uh, we just, 
almost today I think we almost automatically assume, oh look, God, is, you know, things are going great, therefore God's blessing me. That means God's with me. No, don't put all, don't just assume that because of that you're you're good. There's more to it than that. That's why we study God's word to make sure we are truly with Him. <coughs> all right, there's one more event in the Bible while I'm thinking of this. There is an event where during the reign of a very good king. You guys should remember this because it wasn't that long ago we talked about it. During the reign of a very good king, the people were doing great, but they discovered something that changed everything. You remember? King well, Josiah. Good King Josiah. What happened in the days of good King Josiah? They found the book of the law. They found the book of the law. The temple was so messy, it was a pigsty. They, had to, they lost the temple. They lost the... The, the Bible in the temple. They, they lost the book of the law. <laughs> and then they found it and they read it and they realized, we haven't been doing this stuff for a long time. Mm. And does God say, oh, that's okay. You guys did your best. <laughs> no. no. God says, hey, you, you are right. You are guilty of all these things. But because you have humbled yourself before me, the punishment's not going to be what it would have been. But you're still not right with me. You still have problems, sin that needs to be dealt with. So, but I can only imagine, you know, good king, everything seems to be going well. God's blessing them, but that, that's not the end of the story. We need the words of God, the book of his law, which is why we study the Bible so much. It's pretty important. Nice example. Verse 13 says, oh, wait, wait, verse 10. Yeah. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land. Unleavened cakes, parched grain, and the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, remind us, what is, what is this manna that he's talking about? And why is it significant? What is it? What is it? The word literally means what is it? But what, 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 what is this actual stuff? What, what, what was the what is it? It was their food. Was it was their food while they were wandering around in the wilderness. God kept their shoes from wearing out. He had a rock follow them to give them something to drink. And he rained down or he provided this food that's described. And I can't really tell you what that all the description means. But it was a nutritional enough food to keep them alive in the desert. And he did that all throughout 40 years. But then... They cross into the land, and for the very first time, they wake up. Oh, something's different. But, uh, that manna stuff, it's not here anymore. Why? Well, because there's food of the land. This is the land I'm supposed to be giving you, milk. and you can eat from it. So we don't need that anymore. Yeah? Is that what milk and honey is? The land like of... A, like, um, there's just a lot of produce and it's prosperous. And oh, yeah, I think that's what it means. The land flowing with milk and honey, those are probably just examples of the kind of good foods, you know. It's sort of like when someone says, is that a good restaurant? Oh, man, that steak. I'm pretty sure they serve more than just one steak, but, <laughs> you, you know, that typifies a, hmm, that means something. Or, oh, that cat, oh, that means Chinese food. You know what I mean? It, it typifies <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Scratch that. Um, I didn't hear it. I didn't. Got carried away. Um, sometimes when you follow God, though, it gets scarier before it gets better, doesn't it? Would, would anyone say, you don't have to say this out loud necessarily, but would any of you say that since following God, it got a little bit harder before it got better? Or maybe it's still kind of harder right now, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'm with you, too. Just because you follow them doesn't mean it's smooth sailing from there out. Sometimes the seas get rougher. Um, that's part of, the, part of the journey. Verse 13 says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell to his face on the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now a number of times in the Bible you'll read that God sends angels to, uh, hit, which the word angel means what? Messengers. Messengers. Yeah, that's a good quiz question, by the way. The word angel means messenger. It's just a messenger. 
And a lot of times it'll just say an angel from God came. But usually when it uses the phrase the angel of the Lord, that usually signifies, wait a minute, this isn't just an angel. This is God himself coming. Now what do we call it when, another question's coming up by the way, what do we call it when God represents himself, when God manifests himself in some way that we can understand what he is? Theophany. Theophany. We call it a theophany. A theophany is a manifestation of God. It's like when God appeared in a burning bush. God's not really a burning bush, but it was a theophany. It was God showing himself to, to us. Well, this is what we have here. We have a theophany. We have this man with a sword, the commander of the Lord's army. And it's, it's pretty clear that it's God because angels didn't accept worship. You remember that? Right. Angels would say, whoa, I'm not the one you worship. You know, stop bowing to me. Get, get. But he immediately bows, and then the, this uh, commander says, take off your sandals. It's pretty clear God is talking to him. And that's a scary, scary sight. Um, God himself is the one that speaks. And that brings us to chapter 6. So, Willie, are you my other reader? I am. Oh, bless your heart. Can you be the one who reads the first 14 verses? Read the story for us. Chapter 6, the chapter first six. 14 yeah. verses. Right. Now, Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of rams, ram's horns, in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, son of nobody, called the <laughs> priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard, going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the people returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Thank you, Willie. So what kind of procession do we have here? Did, did you guys put that together? It's, I believe it's something like, we know the Ark is in there, because that's significant. Mm -hmm. So the Ark of the Covenant, and I can't really draw, but it had these poles that they carried it by. But it, there were guards in front <coughs> that marched, right? Yeah. And not only were there guards in front, there were also priests. Seven trumpets in front too with the trumpets and then you've got the priests carrying the ark too you got them right <laughs> there's actually more of them but whatever and then you've got all the people behind the, the huge crowd of people behind so we've we've got pretty specific instructions about how to get it done and the way in which it's supposed to happen and the trumpets are blowing the whole time city of jericho is actually, it's said to only be about, I believe it's 12 or 13, it's about 13 acres large. It's not a very big city. It would take a group, a big group this size, probably about an hour to get around it. So we're not talking about an impossible task or anything, you know, that earth shattering, haha, <laughs> no pun intended if you know the rest, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not, it's not anything all that amazing, just an hour's work and then I wonder about the downtime, personally. I, I kind of wonder, the people who, all right, what's the command of the Lord? All right, let's walk around. All right, whew, took an hour. All right, what's next? 
Go to sleep. I don't know. Let's play cards. What? what? There's nothing else. We got to wake up, and do it again tomorrow. Okay, but the whole rest of the day, what are they doing? I guess just sitting around. I, I, and it's it, isn't it in the sitting around times that that's when the enemy gets in because people start to grumble. I don't see anything happening. Mm -hmm. I don't see stuff going on. Why? Why is something? Why is anything going on? Was he slacking on his leadership? And they start talking about it. And isn't that interesting? But yet, that was part of the design. For whatever reason, it was calculated, and God said, do this, now wait. Then again, wait. A whole lot more waiting than marching is what I'm getting at there. But it's part of it. Just obey. Verse 15 says, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day. Why? Because they got a big march ahead of them. And marched around the city in the same manner, but seven times. It was only on that day they marched around the city the seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. By the way, did you catch what he said? Shout, why? Why shout? For the Lord will give you the city? Shout, because the Lord's about to give you the city. Right. What did he say? No, has given. It, it has says given. has given. In other words, when you obey God, it's as good as done. You can bank on it ahead of time if you want. It's that short. The Lord has given you. You know, interesting faith there. Shout for the Lord has given. It's as good as done. He has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. It is a sacrifice to God. God gets the first. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, uh, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Uh, by the way, that phrase there, this guy, this archaeologist, uh, Bryant Wood, or was it Woods? I don't know. <laughs> that guy, um, he points out to the Hebrew, and I need to check this out, but he said most versions say it this way, the walls fell down flat. But the, the more literal version of the Hebrew is the wall fell in itself. Really? Or inside itself. Like in yeah. Imploded? Sort imploded. of like yeah. the idea of an implosion. And what's interesting is in archaeology, um, you discover, and we'll look at this in a bit, but you discover there's actually two walls. There was, there, there was the lower wall and there was the upper wall. And so if On they both collapsed side? into themselves, it was, in other words, two walls around the city, a double-layered wall. Mm -hmm. So when the wall f fell in itself, it actually makes perfect sense if the walls came down in themselves. You know, it's just an interesting little tidbit there. Um, now where are we? Where was I at? Yeah, weren't there rooms in the walls all the way around? And yeah. The walls were essentially I don't know about all the way around, but there were definitely places where... Um, and, and he gets into that too. I should have paid better attention, I guess. But he, he talks about um, either they were right, they were either in the wall or the, the word actually mean right on the surface of the wall. So the rooms may not be built into the wall. In other words, it could have been in between that space of lower wall, upper wall, place right there. It could have been inside the wall itself, or it could have just been right next to the wall, but you, you know, it, your, your house butts up against the side of the wall. So. Because the word, I think the word is surface the, for the Hebrew word, the face so of the wall. So the one wall is still standing? No, no, actually it's not. But there is a tiny little part that is still standing. Mm. Interesting, why would there be a tiny little part of wall still standing? Because or at least later on. Hey, well, what do you know? I guess, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Just a How long just a coincidence. Did huh? Ray have, have that uh, yeah. cloth? In the that's a good question. Well, no. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that's a very good question because there's a, it must have been a long time. It must have been her new decoration. You know, <laughs> that's an excellent yeah. point. Because how long is she waiting around there for? Well, okay, no, it's coming, but 
<laughs> oh, I'm tired. I need to wash it anyway. Let's take it down. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good point. I'm glad you said yeah. that. Um, all right, now I'm... You're at the end of 20. You have thank you. Verse 21 uh, says, They devoted all the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, to the edge of the sword. Now, every time people are killed and God ordains it, usually we want to know why. Um, there's, a, there's a problem asking the question why, because when you say why God, do you, why God, do, you are implying that there is a reason that dictates God do anything. Well, if God's God, there is no why. He's God. He does whatever he does, right? We have no right to ask the question why. But sometimes he's gracious enough to clue us into things anyway. And do you remember when God, uh, what are some of the reasons why God would uh, ask that not just the men, but everyone in a city be destroyed when the people came in? Yeah, sin is the main reason, right? And, what'd you say? Sorry. For purity. Um, well, yeah, and purity, because I I, was it AI? Or, or I don't want to jump ahead, but mm -hmm. I can't remember the, the instance when when even the animals were killed because of yeah. all of the hideous things that were being yes. going Yes, well, on. and it happens yeah. here. And, and as far as the instance, I'm not sure if I know of one particular one. As far as I know, it was commonplace throughout the region. And, and earlier, um, it even mentions, God even says, that the sin of these people, the Canaanites, hasn't reached its peak. In other words, they're not ready to be destroyed yet. They're bad, but they're not that bad. But when they got to the point where they were that bad, then God allowed Israel to come in and wipe them out. And, and if you think about it, sin, you deserve it. Oftentimes, you know, women and children might be complicit with the sin as well. Animals might have S diseases and stuff from the sexual activity of these wicked practices and the people there. And one other thing that we can't forget, and the reference for this is 1 Kings chapter 14, around verse 12 and verse 13. We, we don't have to look it up if you don't want, but uh, 1 Kings 14, verses 12 through 13, is the brief account of a wicked king's child, a wicked king named Jeroboam, and he had a son that was born, or was about to be born, and the, a prophecy is spoken about him and his family. And it's a case of, just like these guys, Jeroboam, you're so wicked. God detests every part of your family. Therefore, your whole family is going to be destroyed. Every single one of them is bad, except there's only one. This newborn child that is about to come into the world, God sees, which by the way, this kind of hints at God's foreknowledge too, but God, this is the only person of your entire family that God has found some favor with, that he's seen something good in. So God says, I'm going to allow him to die which, if, if that weren't in the Bible, a lot of things might be puzzling, but that clues us into something pretty spectacular. Sometimes, death is God's way, even though it's a bad thing, it is God's way of sparing someone suffering, especially for the children. Now, if you, if you uh, believe in, well, Romans class will deal with the whole <laughs> sin issue, I guess, you can deal with that, but if you believe people are born into sin, then you got a real problem on your hands here. But I don't, and I think the Bible doesn't teach that, so it's very easy to look at a passage like this and recognize, mm -hmm. you know, God knows exactly what their life would be, and sometimes that is his way of sparing them. So perhaps that is another thing happening, too, when the kids are killed. Just remember, if God ordains it, he's got his reasons, and that could be one of them. So I guess that's about all we can say about that. Cool. Any other questions, comments? All right. Verse... Um, 22 after that says but to the two men who had spied out the land Joshua said go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her so the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her and brought out all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel and they burned the city with fire and everything in it only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute in her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. 
and she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, or of his firstborn, shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. So I want to read, anyone want to read 1 Kings 16, 34? This is a passage that comes from the time of Ahab. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. Who, who will look that up real quick? Thanks, Gabe. Look that up for us. <coughs> So we now know that the red scarf was in there because she's, he went in and took everything out of her house. So. He knew where to go, didn't he? Yeah, so it was still there. Obviously it was. <laughs> Obviously. All right. First, first Kings, uh, wait, yeah, First Kings 16, 34. What does that say? In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sigub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Okay, okay. So this prophecy actually came true. Somebody did rebuild the city, and guess what happened? What, what was said would happen? His firstborn was killed, right? Mm -hmm. So that, now cast that uh, first king's... 16 passage reference to that. All right, you see if I can show you these pictures and then we'll stop here. I won't quite make my goal, but that's okay. It is all right. This is the map of the conquest as best I can show you. So this is the region that we're dealing with. Wake up. Here we go. Technology. All right, so they're coming through the Dead Sea and Jericho is where they first meet and then AI. And we're going to get into some of that later on. So that's one picture, but there's more in relation to this discussion that I think is important. This is a picture of the region of Jericho. I think it's Whoa. a more modern one. It's kind of what we got of the ruins there. It's interesting stuff. Now, the reason why I want to show you some of these, um, you know it doesn't show up very well, more the ruins of some of the compartments there. That's Jericho as well? Yeah, my understanding is these are all different places. This is important. These are shards of pottery are pieces of pottery found that were burnt. Remember, the city was burned, right. but they still had grain in them. Whoa. So that's, that's kind of important, too, if you think about it, because looters and people like that, I mean, if it was just sitting dormant for a long time, looters come and take that stuff, right? You don't just leave good food sitting around. And if you were running away and it was dormant, you wouldn't have full things of food. It's, it, it speaks of someone who had to get out of there fast. You know, there's this big fire or whatever. So that's kind of important. This is kind of a rendition, a guess, of what the wall might have looked like. Now, I guess it's really, really small, but this is what they're thinking. By the way, go back and check this out, but when the people stormed Jericho, we read that part already, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Chapter 6. Yeah. Did it say the word up? Go up into the city? Did your Bible say that? Look, at, look and see. Verse 6. Where, where were they? Chapter 6, somewhere in chapter 6, where they rush into the city. Mine says, Israelites charged straight into the city. Okay, straight into the city. Straight in, and they took the city. What verse you have? What verse is that? 20. All right, verse 20. So the people shouted, trumpets were blown. So the people, and see, my version says... So yeah, that the people, people went, went up, up into the city. The people went up into the city. Hebrew word there is most often translated up. The people went up into the city. Oh. Now, how would somebody, why would somebody say something like that? Right. Oh, well, if the city was built on an embankment, I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. went up into the city. Just another little hint that we're talking about real events here. Um, the reason why I wanted you guys to see this and I want to discuss this is found in Wikipedia. Just go to Wikipedia and look at their uh, explanation of the Battle of Jericho. And, and it's sad, but this is a real debated issue. But they're going to say something like, the Bible can't be right. It's just all wrong. 
Um, and that is because there have been multiple excavations there. The first one was done by a guy named Garstein in the 1930s. Um, he dug it up and he dated it to roughly the 1400s, right where it should be. And he found a lot of these findings and it was very clear to him. Uh, later on, uh, a lady, a British lady named Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s also excavated there and she changed his date and said, no, this actually happened uh, in the 1500s and they did some carbon dating or radiocarbon or however that works and they and they tried to verify that too and when people in on Wikipedia will read this too they'll say yeah the first guy he was kind of religious that's why he wanted it to be in the 1400s or whatever um, now take a step back for a second and just realize isn't it interesting that all these coincidences that we put together you find a city with with because what they're saying is they're suggesting that during the time that the Bible says the conquest happened, there was no Jericho to take over. And if there was, it was little, it was pitiful, there was no walls. That's what is the common secular position. Um, but I believe it's wrong. And uh, I'm not an expert, so I, what, what can I say? But there's pretty good evidence, I think, for you to, to fight this argument here. Because why would you have pottery jars full of stuff. If the place has been empty for eons of years, why do you have burnt jars full of food? I don't get that. Why, you know, do you, people just leave food lying around and yeah. nobody bothers to pick it up? Um, and the other thing that's important to point out is another guy, and that's where the Bryant Wood, Woods, Wood guy comes back in. Is he is a modern day, uh, his, his uh, expertise is canine pottery. And he, uh, went over the research of Garstein and the pottery that he found. And by the way, Kathleen Kenyon didn't even study the pottery. She didn't even do that. Um, he went over that and he said, hold on, I think I got a picture. Here it is. These shards of pottery are clearly 14th century Canaanite pottery. Really? Definitively, he says, between the mid to late part of the 14th century. And that's his specialty. And so he makes a strong case to say, you know what, I think Kathleen got the date wrong. And then you throw in all those other coincidences, I think he's got a great argument. But Wikipedia and anyone else who doesn't want to believe is obviously going to side with, well, the lady corrected him and the Bible's all wrong. Well, whenever, <laughs> and there it tells us about this other man that uh, was rebuilding. Mm -hmm. How long was it before he rebuilt? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that was... It could have been at the time where she was studying. Yeah, it, it could have been. I think it was a lot later, though, because it, this, would, this would have been... Maybe not. Well, she was actually studying... Or she said it was earlier, though, and they were saying that during the period... They were saying that it was actually destroyed earlier and at the time that the Bible said it should have been destroyed there was no, no city there and he's trying later. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm messed up it confuses me because we go backwards you know we, the, we raise the number to go backwards in the BC's you know anyway I think you guys understand that the Bible's still true you can go home and sleep easy tonight so <laughs> oh yeah even though you'll read some websites that say the exact opposite just look into it there's some good information in there so. Thanks, guys. You should get some sleep. It's been a long night. Thanks. Uh, awesome, man. It was fun. Thanks, uh, I appreciate you. Yeah. 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 How's your feet? How's my feet? They're better. They're not sweating as much. Good.